right, this week we have an amazing guest. We have uh, Jeff Chan, he's a pro MMA fighter and he has a YouTube channel called MMA Shredded, which is absolutely amazing. One of my favorite martial arts channels in general, where he goes through uh, tutorials, he breaks down certain fighters tactics, which I like a lot. Um, and in the over four years of starting this channel, he's gotten about 258,000 subscribers and some of his videos have over a million views. So he's become very, very prominent in the martial arts sphere. So this week we have on Jeff Chan to talk about his views on martial arts, his personal path, his diet, what he does to maintain his health and all those things. Uh, lately, I've been having people on from different kind of fields and paths on the podcast because I really believe that healing can come from so many avenues. And personally, myself, I found martial arts to be a spiritual path in a sense. Um, so without further ado, we have uh, Jeff Chan here. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, listening to the Herbal Hour with Dr. Dan. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Let's uh, get started. All right. So how did you get into martial arts? What's the story of your first interest? What sparked it? And how you got going? Okay, so I started, I think at age 15, um, when I was in elementary school, high school, I've always been that guy who liked play fighting. So I'd be in the back of like science class playing shot for shot in the arms with my, my hockey friend. And I, I just always play fight it. And I guess I believe one day my, one of my best friends, he just brought me into uh, the Ottawa Academy of Martial Arts, which is the gym that I train at. Uh, they changed the name now, but he just brought me in and I tried Muay Thai and kind of just fell in love with it. I didn't have a specific reason. I just joined. Mm. What was the mindset change that brought you from a kind of amateur level to I want to do it at a pro level? Because uh, I've done like one amateur fight and it was so intense. Did you have like a feeling like this was, you know, that was the path for you? Did you have some kind of intuition about that? So for me, I never saw myself as a fighter and I still don't call myself a fighter right now. I trained Muay Thai just as a hobby uh, for cardio uh, because I like fighting or at least play fighting. Um, and then my coach at the time, crew, Jeff Harrison, he pushed me towards competition because he thought I was very talented in it. So I kind of just took one fight after the other as an amateur. And I only did Muay Thai competitions. I did like a few jujitsu tournaments, but uh, that wasn't even until I transitioned into MMA. So I started with just Muay Thai and uh, I was successful with my amateur career. And then my coach at the time was like, you should uh, jump into MMA. You can smoke these MMA guys in the street. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm like, but I don't have any jujitsu. So he's like, it's okay. We'll train right now. So I literally like took a fight and started training jujitsu. And, uh, you know, as he said, the first fight I finished by TKO and didn't even get to the ground. But then the second fight, I went in as a white belt and I was winning the striking, but he did eventually take me to the ground. He was a wrestler and choked me out. So then and I didn't fight again until uh, I worked more on my jiu-jitsu. But back to your, your original question, I never had plans to compete and I never had plans to turn pro. Uh, mm. my instructor just was like, Hey, you're, you're good enough. You should do it. And at this time I was, I think 18 or 19. So in my head, I'm like, Hey, it'd be cool to get paid to fight. It'd be cool to call myself as a professional fighter, but that that's all it was. I never had ambitions to make it to one championship. I never had ambi ambitions to, you know, go into the UFC. It was just, I trained, I got the opportunity and I took it. Uh, I actually spent eight to 10 years of my life trying to get into law enforcement. That was mm -hmm. my career objectives. What caused that switch? I remember reading a little bit that you had some uh, personal life things that happened to you that uh, made you kind of switch over from pursuing a career in law enforcement to doing uh, fighting professionally. What was that change? What was it something about the actual uh, work as law enforcement or was it just that your passion was in martial arts or, or something of that matter? So as I was trying to obtain a position in law enforcement, like I studied criminology, I went back to university 
that did police um, foundations and did my volunteer hours. And my main focus was law enforcement, but at the same time, I continued to train martial arts and not, not only because I loved it, but because I thought it would give me credentials to apply it as a police officer. The fact that I have martial arts um, as an asset and competing, I thought would give me an edge. Mm. So basically everything I did was to get into law enforcement. So I started off training Muay Thai and competing as an amateur. And I'm like, Hey, this, you know, racking up amateur fights gets me in shape, gets me, teaches me self-defense that will help me become a police officer. And, uh, so once I finished high school, I went to university and I continued to compete as an amateur. And then when I was given that opportunity to turn pro, I was like, Hey, I would be a professional fighter who applies to the police service. Uh, but anyways, after I fought and lost my second fight, I'm like, mm. okay, maybe, maybe fighting's not for me. Mm. I'm going to continue training. Cause that's what I love doing. I love training, but fighting is a whole different thing. It's so stressful. You got to diet. It's just, you know, it's different. Uh, and then I was having a difficult time getting into law enforcement, even though I had my degree and diploma, they're just very, very competitive. And it's, uh, it's tough to get in, especially at my age at the time. So I moved to Toronto and continued to, uh, I worked security to get more experience and volunteering and everything. And I was applying to different services, but I couldn't get in. So I was like, okay, well, I can't get in. I may as well find other ways to gain more experience. So I continued doing my work, uh, volunteering hours, but then I was like, Hey, why not take another fight? So then I fought again. I fought, uh, this, by then I got my purple belt. So I fought and won my fight by submission and I'm like, Hey, maybe I could continue this. Maybe not. But my main focus was still law enforcement. So then I had three fights. And, um, I, after that fight, I was like, okay, I'm going to apply to law enforcement again. Couldn't get in. Mm. And then, uh, I went to Thailand to go meet a guy named Sean Fagan, the Muay Thai guy. I don't know if you've heard of him. I believe I have, uh, is he, uh, the YouTube channel fight tips? No, that's Shane Fa- Faison. Okay. But, close. but, but close. <laughs> yes. Um, the Muay Thai guy, his channel is called the Muay Thai guy. He's, uh, he has like a big beard, bald head, but anyways, he does what I do, but for Muay Thai. So I had a friend who was like, Hey, you should uh, come with me and attend his training camp. So I went to Thailand for a month to go meet him and train with him and, and train with like the Thai instructors. And during that time I um, got to know him and I was very inspired by what he did. He helps thousands of people just like I currently do. And that motivated me to start my own, but in MMA. So he was actually like my mentor. He's the one who said like, Hey, Jeff, why not? Why don't you do it too? So I actually filmed a few of my videos or first few videos with his camera. Yeah. So when you lost your first fight, Mm -hmm. I'm imagining you were devastated because fighting is like a different thing. It's not, you know, a demotion at work. It's Mm -hmm. almost kind of life and death. And when you lose, it's like, you might be walking around with your head down low for months. So how did you switch back into gear and want to get back into fighting after, uh, after that? I think it just comes with time. I remember after that loss and the thing is with my amateur career, I had two losses and I had about 25 fights. So I was pretty used to winning. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I did lose, I was, yeah, I was devastated. I didn't want to fight. And uh, my coach actually asked me to take another fight like a month later. And I was like, oh, I'm going to focus on my law enforcement and, and train as a martial artist because that's what I love doing. And I didn't want to go through the weight cut and all, the, all that stuff. Um, but then after some time passed, I just kind of felt motivated again. And uh, yeah. How do you view uh, martial arts? Is it uh, a path to you know, building your character? Do you view it in a spiritual sense? Do you view it in a athletic sense? What's your, like, where does your love of it come from? I initially did it for fitness. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that, you know, as I trained martial arts, I started to realize that I've become a more respectful person. Um, I developed discipline, um, self-defense, credentials towards law enforcement, and uh, I would say the main thing is now I, I really enjoy doing it. I, mm. I just love the lifestyle of being a martial artist. Um, 
and, and, and it makes you a very humble person. Mm. So I would say not spiritual. I don't know if that's the right, right word, but uh, yeah, I just love being a martial artist. Mm. Yeah. There's, there's definitely something uh, a little bit more to martial arts uh, I find in my life than, you know, just lifting weights or something like that. Yeah. In fact, it makes the kind of things you might do at the gym. Uh, it gives you a lot more motivation to do them because it's yes. like you want to train for martial arts, but mm -hmm the martial arts in and of itself is kind of its own goal. Like just to do the thing is uh, the purpose of it. I wanted to ask you a question from one of our listeners. Sure. Uh, so he has been training with me uh, Muay Thai and he has a background in boxing and he's looking to transition into MMA. And he wanted to ask you what are, the big tips and things that you would focus on in trying to become an MMA fighter, uh, trying to transition from kickboxing to MMA. I would first uh, start wrestling because wrestling is the key to deciding whether the fight is going to stay mm. standing or get to the ground. There's many successful boxers and wrestlers who, sorry, there's a lot of successful fighters who have boxing and wrestling, but maybe not jujitsu. But if you have uh, jiu-jitsu and, and, and striking, well, then generally MMA is like Muay Thai, jiu-jitsu, and wrestling is what combines the two. So if you have good wrestling, you can keep it standing. And if you don't, then you might have to fight on the ground. Um, in terms of being a kickboxer, because I used to have that very Muay Thai style guard. Mm -hmm. like, like with like guard. arms kind of it, forward exactly. and like that. So you could do elbows and stuff. Standing very narrow, uh, tall, uh, is the first thing I would do is switch the stance. So now I, I take a more wider stance and I also mm -hmm. drop the hands a bit because keeping your hands lower really significantly helps you with the mm -hmm. takedown defense and also the footwork with the, I find Muay Thai style, the stance, it really limits your footwork, but in MMA, you're kind of going in and out, in and out all the time. Mm hmm how do you uh, train? What does your training schedule look like? Let's say it's, you know, a month or two out from a fight. What is your everyday training look like? Do you do strength and conditioning? Do you uh, do specific drilling? Uh, I do strength and conditioning. I try to do it twice a week. Uh, I used to do it more. Um, I was also a lot more muscular at the time, but uh, now I find I rather just uh, spend my time training martial arts over strength and conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll do it maybe twice a week, sometimes even one, if I decide to do more martial arts training. But um, I'll train about th three, four times a week, jiu-jitsu, sometimes five, and striking, I'll do two. So I feel like my strengths are striking and jiu-jitsu, I'm you know playing catch-up. So I'm trying to do more jiu-jitsu than striking. And I'll spar about twice a week. Usually my training consists of just sparring when it comes to striking. And then jujitsu is just like regular jujitsu class. Mm. Um, a tip for those who um, want to know how I improve myself when it comes to sparring and striking is I always go to a sparring session with a goal. Like I'll never mm. go into sparring uh, and freestyle it. I'll always have like a, a piece of paper and I'm like, okay, I'm going to work on these specific counters or these specific combos it plays hand in hand with what i do for a living i make videos and i produce content but that's how i learn like i'll i'll have a list of techniques that i want to pull off and i literally go into that session and i just try those techniques out mm. will you practice those uh techniques on your own in a kind of uh shadow boxing or going through the form and then try to apply it or do you just kind of get in there and just try to do it in the, in the live setting? I just jump in and, and do in the okay. live setting. Like now, that. when I have a fight coming up, I do specific drills that help me prepare for a fight. It helps me prepare um, my instincts and timing. But when I'm not, when I don't have a fight coming up, then I kind of just jump in a sparring. Mm. One of the things that I really love about your channel is how you take uh, great martial artists um, like Anderson Silva, uh, St. Pierre, and then you kind of, you know, break down 10 of their advanced tactics or like seven of their uh, moves. Mm -hmm. um, 
Is that your approach to how you learn martial arts? Do you like to watch uh, fighters that you respect and try to kind of absorb what they're doing that's unique? Yes, that's exactly it. Uh, it's funny because I have a Muay Thai background, but you know, if someone had no idea who I was and watched some footage of me, they'd be like, oh, this guy's got a karate background. But I've never trained karate in my life. And it's because <laughs> I watched George St. Pierre and I copied his wide stance. Um, it's because I watched Leota Machida. That's why I have those blitz tactics. You know, I watched uh, Jose Aldo. That's how I have those low kicks. Mm. And I basically, you know, take a bit of each and kind of add it to my own arsenal. Mm. So there's a saying by uh, Bruce Lee. It goes something like, I'm paraphrasing here. Um, take what is useful and get rid of the rest. That's, that's exactly it. Of MMA. So yeah. on that subject of Bruce Lee, who are your uh, biggest martial artist inspirations? Like a few of your top ones that, you know, you strive to be like that have inspired you either through their character or through their style. I would say uh, George Nick Pierre. Mm -hmm. in terms of how humble he is. I like mm -hmm. his attitude towards uh, being a martial artist. Um, I definitely took his wrestling style and his wide stance. I would say I took the low kicks from Jose Aldo, the footwork from Dominic Cruz, the head movement from TJ Dillashaw, and uh, and the blitz from, from Wonderboy Thompson or, or Leo Machida. Mm. The footwork and, from Dominic Cruz. He... Yeah. He has some of the most interesting footwork that I've ever seen. I mean, he's just in and out, in and out, moving around. I, I almost don't understand how he has the stamina for it. Is that Do you have to just train like cardio and train doing that to be able to move around like that? To be honest, I don't know. That, that, I guess that's his secret to being the you know, former champion. But uh, I, I don't believe in the extent of – like I don't believe that – the amount of footwork he uses is necessary, but <laughs> I, but I do like his style and I've taken a bit of it and kind of added to my own. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Another thing I like with your, um, your videos is that, uh, and I've heard other people say in the comments, things like this, where, uh, you'll show yourself, um, trying the techniques that you're uh, teaching in sparring. And then my favorite part is you show the, times you messed up and like how how like unclean sometimes the transition between you know somebody's holding like a a mitt for you and you're trying the technique and you look sharp you look amazing yeah. but then you try to land it on somebody when they're trying to hit you and it just looks kind of sloppy but it still yeah. like lands and things like that that that's I, I feel like that's a very important part of it because i never like i'm not there to show off i'm not here to like tell everyone hey i'm the best you know if i want to show that I was the best, which I don't believe I'm the best, but if I were, I would compete and I would be fighting, taking fight after fight. But if you think about it, I've, I turned pro in 2012, it's 2021 soon. And I've only had five pro fights. It's not a lot. That's because, you know, fighting was never really my goal. Um, but anyways, back to what I was saying is when I teach, it's very important to show the student that, you're not going to get it on the, you're not going to be perfect on the first try and you're going to fail and doing pads means nothing. Like if you can smash pads and look great at it, it doesn't mean you're going to land it in, in, in a fight or a sparring match. Exactly. Um, and that's uh, Instagram is filled with those things. People have, yeah. kind of, you know, they do martial arts as a kind of hobby and then they do some nice pad work, but they never show their actual, you know, sparring where they're getting hit where they're looking exactly. like a fool, which is real. It, it's important stuff. and it's important to be to be real and and yeah let everyone know that i failed probably 50 times before i landed at one mm. yeah do you have any advice for people who uh are listening to this podcast and are looking for a new avenue of fitness and the idea of martial arts kind of uh interests them but they're not they don't want to fight necessarily they don't you know want to be a professional fighter do you have any advice for them on how they can get the maximum uh, health and uh, fitness benefit from martial arts? Honestly, I recommend everybody join a local gym. Mm -hmm. You can't go wrong with smashing pads. Like we were talking about how 
just smashing pads is, is doesn't make you a fighter. But I love smashing pads. I I I always film my uh, combo of the weeks. So I love smashing pads. I love long combinations. It really pushes the cardio and it releases some some kind of stress. Like if I have a stressful day or I'm upset or I'm worried or whatever it is, because I've gone through some problems in my life and um, that's actually what caused me to leave law enforcement. But, you know, um, when I go into a, a, you know, a class and I smash pads, I forget about it all. Mm. And I come, I, I leave the gym. I'm super happy. And uh, yeah, I, I just think it's amazing and everyone should do it. And on top of that, not only are you getting fit, you're learning self-defense. You never know nowadays. Mm-hmm. There are crazy people out there. And just knowing that you can defend yourself really uh, helps. Yeah. And just knowing that you can defend yourself and having that deep confidence from experience, it actually helps you avoid confrontation, actually helps you avoid fights, which is kind of paradoxical. But when you know the reality of fighting, you know how unpredictable it is and you have a kind of respect for not taking it kind of lightly. So some people, I've heard people say, um, you know, young guys shouldn't go into martial arts because they'll make them more aggressive. I've heard people say things like this and I'm like, it couldn't be further from the truth because after a session of, uh, you know, sparring or uh, hitting pads, not only do you get an amazing workout, but you feel like good. You feel actually uh, nice. You feel like you want to be kind to people. You feel relaxed, not afraid, not as reactive. So there's a big psychological component to martial arts that goes a little bit beyond just lifting weights. There's something about, I think, being so um, present in the moment, as you were saying, your mind's kind of clear. Mm -hmm. Because when you're there, it's like, that's all that you think about. And all the problems go away, uh, you know, for an hour or two for for that session. Mm -hmm. And even I always uh, enjoy the kind of afterglow of uh, like a good training session where I I feel like I'm not afraid of anything because, you know, Mm -hmm. I just had punches come at me. I just had kicks come at me. And, you know, I'm not like scared of some assignment that I have to do or some work that I have to do. Exactly. I totally agree. To, to what you're saying, um, I feel like young guys who join gyms, they get humbled. Mm. Uh, I would say that's the biggest thing. Like me and myself included, I've been humbled by my coaches and, and just more senior uh, fighters at the time. And it just makes you think like these guys can be super respectful, nice, but they can, they're killers as well. And it makes you want to copy them. And they become uh, my idols. Mm. So going back to uh, St. Pierre, you said he was one of your uh, favorite fighters because of his mentality and his character. Mm -hmm. What do you think makes a great martial artist in terms of their character? What is that quality to you? Um, I would say respect Mm. is is a big thing Um, and being humble and I would say you're a martial artist when you actually enjoy training. I think they're and learning being a martial artist means learning and trying new things and um, taking the time to perfect it versus fighting. There's a lot of fighters out there who kind of fight too much and they're not crafting their skills. Mm -hmm. My training when I'm, not fighting is completely different from when I'm training for a fight. Like when I'm training for a fight, I'm pushing the cardio all high intensity and I'm working on things that I'm already good at just to prepare for that fight. But when I'm not fighting, I go into a sparring session, like I was explaining and I'm trying new things that I've never tried before and I'm losing and failing, getting hit. And that's how I learn and evolve. Mm. Whereas if I'm training for a fight, I'm not trying new things. I'm not learning new things. I'm just drilling what I'm already good at. Mm. So preparing for a fight, do you do any kind of mentality training? Is there any kind of affirmations you say to yourself, any kind of special practices to give yourself on mental edge, or is it more just uh, training and, and getting used to the kind of heat of combat? I would say just training and getting the cardio up. I've tried meditating a bit, but it's not, it helped here and there because I get really stressed for fights Mm -hmm. um, and the, and the stress zaps my cardio. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I'm, 
I'm very calm in a fight, but subconsciously it zaps my cardio. Mm-hmm. It's hard to explain. Like I remember when I used to compete, I'd be very nervous and I would know that I'd be nervous. But now when I go into fights, I'm very calm, very, very calm, almost too calm, but I'm still tired because of the, the, the nerves mm. kind of zap you up. It's hard to explain. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I had that experience. So I had one amateur fight in, uh, in kickboxing and I felt, you know, like it's like this deep primal fear because you're about to get into what to your mind is basically life and death. I mean, even though it's not, you know, even though the the ref will stop the fight if it gets too bad or whatever, it mm-hmm. still feels like, you know, life and death. And I think something deep in our kind of human genetics and nature mm-hmm. kicks in, which is like, this is real, like expend all your resources where for that fight, like I just felt like my arms were like noodles <laughs> and um, I was just trying to focus on just the moment and like not getting uh, not getting hit because it's so uh, it's so fast. Like the difference between sparring and an actual fight, uh, like amateur or pro especially, mm-hmm. I imagine is a huge gap because that person's you know they're swinging to take you out. They're not you know going to pull back their punches. They're not going to you know after they land a hit, they're not going to back off and let you recover. Like we do a lot in sparring to be nice to each other. They're going to, you know, hunt after you and and you kind of know that. And I had that same experience where I got so gassed out. Like I didn't even do that much in the first round. I was mostly just blocking because my (laughs) opponent was just doing crazy, you know, like street fighting haymakers at me and things. Uh, But at the end of the first round, I, my lungs were just like, burning i felt the most tired i have in my life and i was like i don't know how i'm going to step in the next round but then I, I did it you just do it yeah i totally understand the nerves kind of get to you yeah uh is there anything that you do now to calm those uh nerves before a fight uh to be honest i just make sure that i'm in shape and ready for the fight so just work ethics just putting in the work i know that if i put in the work um Although I'll feel nervous and be more tired than I should be, uh, at least I put in the work and I should be able to, you know, last the fight. Mm. What are some of your favorite things that you do for uh, conditioning or cardio? I love smashing pads. Mm -hmm. Um, I find running helps to build the legs, but um, smashing pads and and the heavy bag is, is one of my favorite things because you're just hitting your hardest and that's just how it is in a fight. I, you know what? I wish I can fight like Max Holloway where he's mm-hmm. kind of just like tap, 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 mm-hmm. you know, high volume, tap, 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 tap. And just like, he doesn't really punch hard at all. He just pop, 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 pop. But for me, I think it's a style or a genetic thing, but I swing hard every time, every strike, I, <laughs> I almost throw my hardest. And so that's just my style. So that's how I got to train when I hit pads, I barely hit light. I always just hit my hardest. You're a true martial artist training for the thing itself. I, I, I like yeah. that because it's, I've heard this saying, and I think it's absolutely true that if you want to become good at something, do things that are the closest to that thing. So if you want to get good at fighting, uh, spar more. Exactly. If you want to get more in shape, you know, do things like, uh, you know, smashing pads and just really go in a hundred percent. Cause you can, you know, no one's really going to hit you back. There's exactly. no consequence. If, if you're in a, a sparring or especially an amateur pro fight, if you just, you know, go a hundred percent and completely lose your, you know, your whole gas tank, like mm-hmm. you're going to get hurt. Cause you won't even be able, there's a certain point where you get so tired. You can't even keep your hands up, which is, yeah. that's the yeah. dreaded part where you're now, like, I don't know how I'm going to survive this. When it comes to sparring, though, I used to have that mentality of sparring hard. I, I've had like a lot of hard sparring sessions and I used to love them a lot. But now I've actually uh, calmed down with the hard sparring and I'm really focusing on technical sparring, um, high intensity, fast. But um, I, I really like to pull it back to the, to the head now. I'm, you know, not worried, but I'm trying to avoid CT. <laughs> Right. That's a, that's a big yeah. issue with, uh, with boxing for, yeah. for sure. Um, long-term, you know, especially if you, uh, if you don't want to necessarily be a professional fighter or something, yeah. and maybe you have a job 
in a field which requires the use of your mind. Like for me, for example, I'm a naturopathic doctor. So oh, that's wow. one of the reasons why I didn't want to go into okay. professional fighting. Cause it's uh-huh. like, if I really trained the level that I think would be necessary, yep. I would be getting hit all the time. Yeah. I'd be getting hit in the head. And there's all sorts of research uh, coming out about the prolonged effects of like mm-hmm. head trauma, even like minor ones, even, mm-hmm. you know, just you get dazed from a hit. Like that's, that's, that could affect you, especially um, over time. But your style is great for that because I know you like to use a lot of head movement stuff. So if you're going to train and you want to avoid head injury, mm-hmm. get your head movement down. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'd say I'm big on the outside fighting, using footwork. And, and that's, you know, I've watched George St. Pierre and Leo de Machida and Wonderboy Thompson fight like that. And that's how I kind of picked their their footwork and evasive style and added it to my own. I used to fight like, Buakau, do you know who that is? No. Oh, Buakau, yeah, yeah. Buakau, yeah, he's a yeah. monster. Just, you know, he goes is. forward and, you know, <laughs> with the big boxing gloves, when the punch comes and you shell, it, it doesn't go through mm-hmm. and it's a block, but it, you're still getting hit in the head. <laughs> like, you're still getting, you're, right. you're, you're still, still getting, getting rocked. Back. But now I'm liking the hands low style and using mm. that distance to avoid punches so you don't get touched at all. Mm. Yeah, Buakau is, uh, he's insane. If you guys haven't heard of him, he's a, you know, a professional, very well-known uh, Muay Thai fighter in, uh, in Thailand. And I've seen videos where he, he's so intense that he's just like beating up his like pad holder. Like, yeah, have you seen that. that video where he's just like, like chasing beating him around. down and chasing him down? And the guy's yeah, just yeah. like, it literally his pad holder is like running away scared from yeah. him because he's just, <laughs> he's so, in- and that's his, that's kind of his unique style, which is just, yeah put so much like force and so much aggression that the person just folds. He's not, you know, overly technical. He's mm-hmm. not, you know, like a Israel Adesanya that tries to pick you apart, like move around, get like nice, clean, light hits on you just to wear you down. He's like opposite of uh, Sanchai. Sanchai. Yeah. is the technical evasive yeah. style and Boaca is just like a complete machine. I mean, don't get me wrong. His technique is flawless, but he, he, he moves forward at you. <laughs> yeah. And, and Sanchai is really, uh, he's really fun to watch cause he's very playful. It looks yes. like he's just having fun in there. He's exactly. laughing, he's dancing. Like you wouldn't even think that, you know, they were both, you know, trying to take each other out by like yeah. the way he acts. But I guess it's different for people who come up in that tradition in Thailand, right? Because they're trained from a young age to fight and uh, fighting is just what they do like every week. And they don't really think of it as anything special. Uh, what has your experience been with people in Thailand, like how their mentality towards Muay Thai and martial arts differs to? Uh, They're us? super playful and super technical. Um, I haven't seen anybody spar hard, at least the Thais. I haven't seen any of them spar hard. They spar without shin guards as well. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, like you said, it's just another, another day, just a walk in the park. <laughs> Right. I think that's a great uh, mentality towards it. Cause if you're always thinking like, Oh no, it's all or nothing all the time. Yeah. Like you're actually going to get stressed out and it's going to exactly. impact you negatively. Cause there's such a mental component to uh, martial arts. Fighting. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, the confidence in, in going into a fight is uh, very, very important. If you doubt that you'll win, or if you even have a little bit of doubt, most likely you're going to lose that's that's so true you it's almost like you have to be uh there's a saying i believe it's from sun tzu um from the art of war he says uh win before the fight begins yeah so like win mentally before you even arrive at the fight and that principle is interesting because it applies to everything it applies to you know uh asking uh asking someone out on a date it applies to, you know, uh, sending a resume. It applies to sitting in an interview. Like if you're worried and you think you're going to lose, it's not an optimal mindset. Optimal mindset isn't necessarily to be like arrogant, like, oh, I got it. You know, I'm, I'm hot stuff. I'm, you know, yeah. no worries. But to be like, I'm, you know, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to try my best and I'm not going to worry about anything else. I'm just going to, you know, put it all, put it all on the line. So to exactly. Speak. Yeah. What is your strategy in a, in a professional match? What are you thinking of when you're, uh, you know, across from your opponent in terms of like strategy? Is there something that you're aiming for? 
or um, is it kind of I, based on the fight? I think for most fighters, every opponent is different when mm. it comes to strategy. Uh, for my from my experience, all my opponents have, I guess, avoided striking with me and have all wanted to take me down. So um, for my most recent fights, at least for the MMA ones, it's always been keep it standing, watch off the takedown, keep it standing. And my strategy has been pretty simple, and it's just keep it standing and strike. Yeah. Mm. How much do you train the ground game aspect if uh, if your preference is to keep it standing? Is there like certain things to uh, work on specifically? I would imagine maybe things like takedown defense and getting back up and, exactly you know, that mm-hmm. taking taking down defense and uh, getting back up when you're on when you're on the bottom, whether that's uh, in guard or, or any position, just figure out how to stand back up or how to stand back up immediately when you're taken down. Mm. But how, mm. sorry, um, now, you know, if I'm in fight camp, those are the things I'm working at, but on a regular basis, I'm just, I'm training just to as per normal. So I'm working in the gi, I'm doing, um, what a normal jujitsu practitioner would do. Mm. How does your, uh, approach to training differ, uh, with MMA striking versus, you know, Muay Thai striking. Cause Muay Thai, obviously, you know, you might have 10, 12, 16 ounce gloves, mm-hmm. but with uh, MMA, you might have four ounce gloves. How does the striking differ between those things? Is there something that you have to alter to, to transition over into MMA striking? I would say primarily the, uh, the, the guard, mm. as I was mentioning earlier, I used to have that tight guard and it, like every time you punch i'll just basically shell up and look through mm-hmm. the little crack mm-hmm. but i've realized even before using mma gloves but i've realized that you know the glove can slip through the crack but also when you block it still hurts and it still shakes your head so now i decide that you know i keep my hands up but i also drop them and i kind of use my distance management to um to to evade punches instead mm. of yeah yeah, because with those smaller gloves, it's like you can't shell up because there's always going to be some like opening. Yeah, and it's, it's it much hurt, more hurt. interesting. It, it hurt. does hurt. Like, yeah. Don't get me wrong. Some people use it. Like Yoel Romero, he literally just puts his hand on his head and <laughs> that's, that's his guard. I personally don't like that style. I personally rather not get hit in the head. Yeah, it's it's unpleasant. Like one of the most painful things is getting hit like right in the jaw and like, you just feel like that, like nerve shock. Yes. Yeah. It's not good. So when you're training for, um, when you're in your fight camp, what does your diet look like? Like, what are you eating throughout the day? Like breakfast, lunch, dinner, anything specific or pretty average. So when I'm, um, dieting for a fight, the first thing I do is I fast. Mm-hmm. So I will skip breakfast and I'll have my first meal around 2 p.m., 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. And my last meal around 8 to 9 p.m. And I find when I, you know, skip a meal and have only two meals a day, I like I immediately start losing weight. Um, and then, I mean, I fight at, I used to fight at 135, but now with one championship it's 145 but i'm still bantamweight so i only need to diet down to 145 and my walk around weight is about 152 so once i start fasting i go from 152 to about 149 148 sometimes and then the last three pounds would be uh would be on the week of the fight and that's when i cut out the rice Mm-hmm. and uh essentially cut out the carbs and then i just drop to 145 got it so you're doing uh, kind of intermittent fasting where you eat within yes. like a certain window yes yes intermittent fasting and then right before the fight you're doing a kind of uh almost like ketogenic or low carb yeah. type low of carb diet. low carb diet yeah okay um yeah. i mean i eat fairly clean on a regular basis like i truly enjoy eating healthy um my fiance is basically my nutritionist, whatever she puts in front of me, I'll eat, but she cooks very healthy. It's like every meal, chicken, some carbs and some veggies. Yeah. Uh, how did you, uh, figure out this way of eating? Is this something somebody told to you or something you just noticed that you felt better when you ate like that? Yeah. Fasting eat, 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 and low fasting. Carb. 
Um, I watched a uh, podcast with uh, Joe Rogan and George mm-hmm. St. Pierre. And uh, oh, yeah, I, I remember that one. <laughs> when I learned that George St. Pierre fasted, I was like, oh, I'm going to try it too. And yeah, I, since since watching that, I started doing that myself. And in terms of eating clean, uh, it literally the saying like what, it, what whatever you eat, you become what you eat or whatever. You know, mm-hmm. must have heard the saying. It's totally true. If you eat garbage, you're gonna feel like garbage, and if you eat clean, you're gonna feel great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, fasting for certain people, uh, like myself, and it sounds like for you. Mm-hmm. It makes you, when you do it in a proper way and kind of not all the time, not like starve yourself or anything, uh, it makes you feel much more mental clarity. It makes you feel kind of more agile, more quick. Uh, I remember I did a few months of like a pretty strictish ketogenic diet where I was maybe only getting like 50 grams of carbs a day or something even less. And man, I could run forever. I couldn't get tired. It was like impossible for me. Um, (laughs) But I had issues with like um, lifting weights and stuff. Like Strength, I felt yeah. much, much weaker and like less explosive, but I felt more like, you know, I could just run for hours without even, you know, feeling tired. For, for me, I found um, training on an empty stomach definitely helps. Mm-hmm. Like you go into the session feeling really tired and drained, but then once you get warmed up, then you, you perform a lot better than if you were to have food in you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's uh, a kind of uh, survival thing for humans. I mean, we live in a culture, in a world where we're kind of told, you know, three or four meals a day, just eat, 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 even if you don't necessarily train. Um, And we think that it's like necessary or something to, (laughs) you know, even when people get sick, they say, oh, you got to, you know, you got to eat. Yeah. Um, Meanwhile, our bodies are, you know, wired to survive on like no food, just water for, for days and function not only well, but optimally at that level, which is what a lot of research is finding now. I've never experienced uh, fasting for more than, you know, just the morning. Uh, so I can't comment on, on any further, but I, I do know. Uh, so I was just in Dubai for the last five weeks and um, I know a, a girl who just won the uh, world title there. She fasted for three days, which is crazy. Not eating for three days. Like, I don't think I could do that, but yeah. Yeah. The, the longest I've done is three days. Oh, wow. That's insane. And some people, you know, there's this idea of like therapeutic fasting, mm-hmm. especially as a treatment for, uh, for cancer and other chronic diseases where I've heard uh, people will kind of go to this retreat center and they'll, they'll fast for sometimes up to 40 days on just water. And they'll have like a doctor monitor them, like check their urine and blood constantly and make sure. Cause the main thing with fasting to worry about is electrolyte imbalance. Mm-hmm. Otherwise like a, a person can survive months without eating food. Which How is- much did you eat when you finished that fast? Like your first meal back? My first meal back was actually, uh, what was it? It was a a pho. It was like a bowl of pho pho. with a lot of veggies and stuff. When you don't eat for a while, you don't actually, you start like, first of all, you start like fantasizing about food in like a really interesting way, which is like, you know, we're not used to because we eat so often. Mm -hmm. Um, But you don't want to eat a lot actually because it's like after a few days and especially longer than that, your stomach really shrinks up. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, you know, you don't actually want to eat a lot. You feel like, it, it, you know, you, you'll get like stomach pains if, you know, if you fasted for three days and went and ate a Big Mac meal, like you'd be, oh, you'd be, you'd be in pain. Like it would not be good. True. True. Uh, I do know like um, it's a bad habit. Every time I finished a fight though, mm-hmm. I gain a lot of weight because all I want to do is eat. Yeah. <laughs> like I think I went one time from 135 to 160. <laughs> oh, wow. It, 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 like in a span of a week. Yeah. That's super common. I, I, I had the same experience uh, too with, you know, the one amateur fight I had where, you know, I cut down to a very low weight. So mm-hmm. I was, um, what was that? I fought at one, 155. So I, I came in, weighed in 158 and I walk around at like 180 
<laughs> so that's not, you know, that's, that's a decent drop. Mm-hmm. And I remember after the fight, I was just like gorging myself. I was so hungry. It was yeah. almost like all that uh, repressed uh, urges I had to eat suddenly were like, okay, now it's free go. And I was like, well, I might as well treat myself. So mm-hmm. I think that's natural to like go like really strict and then mm-hmm. let it loose and, and et cetera. Another thing for me is I've never been big on sweets. Mm-hmm. I eat, you know, as a child, I didn't eat ice cream. I didn't eat cake or muffins. I didn't eat any of that stuff. But as I started cutting weight, I started to crave sweets. And then now mm. sweets has become part of what I eat. <laughs> but I used to did not like it. But now I guess from dieting and seeing like on a regular basis, if someone puts a muffin in front of me, I'll be like, eh, I don't want it. Like I don't crave it. But then when I was dieting, I would see that muffin and I'd be like, suddenly it looks really good. And then yeah. I start trying it. And then now, now I love, I love muffins. That's how it is, especially with um, these very like high glycemic carbs. So that means uh, you might know that, you know, it goes into your bloodstream, gets converted to glucose very quickly. So it <laughs> causes a kind of insulin spike and then causes like a ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone to, to <laughs> kick in immediately yeah. afterwards. So it's almost like, uh, you get entrained or almost like addicted to like, mm-hmm. uh, kind of carbs. And I, I, people, a lot of people think that you can't go without carbs, mm-hmm. but if you go like, I mean, I, I went for like two months with almost no carbs and I had zero craving for carbs. Like oh, I, wow. the only craving I had was for vegetables. Like I was just, uh, like I wanted, like my body knew it needed carbs. So it was like, carbs in any form so like tomatoes and cucumbers and like anything i was just like ravenously eating them Mm -hmm. i almost couldn't stop but i didn't have like a specific like i would look at you know like a cupcake or something and i'd be like "Eh, whatever that's uh that's impressive that you did three days what sorry what was your reason for doing a three-day fast yeah i um i actually did it as part so i did it two two times actually for three days the most recent time i did it for three days I really just wanted to reset myself. I kind of viewed it in a kind of almost like, you know, spiritual aspect for lack of better term, where I really wanted to like, I always found that when I fast for a few days, it really refocused me. It really recalibrated me. And I had actually a pretty deep insight, especially the third day of the fast (laughs) when I was, uh, I was like walking around town because I walk a lot. And I was just so tired, man. I was so tired. Like I was so depressed. I was so tired. And I, I just had this like, almost like thunderbolt realization of like, wow, like starvation is like, that's like some bad suffering, man. Like the people who are on the streets and stuff, homeless, and they don't eat food for days. I was like, God damn, this is what they feel like when they're walking around. Like they feel like they can like that even just walking is like tiring and gassing them out. Like, Mm -hmm. so it kind of, uh, it brings a lot of gratitude. I think we take like what we have for granted. It's almost, it's this principle of, you know, if you take out a really good thing, you'll appreciate it more. So I kind of was doing it as a reset like that. Um, The time previously, I did it actually as a preparation for a uh, psychedelic experience with, uh, Mm -hmm. with uh, psilocybin. So there's this tradition of, doing uh like a specific you basically like program your mind you try to um journal and think what you want out of the experience and then uh in traditional cultures you'll do like a specific diet or a fast to kind of they say to like cleanse or purify yourself um and so i didn't eat for like three days and then my first meal was the psilocybin uh uh mushrooms and yeah, it, it went very deep. Like it was a very deep experience. I don't think wow. it would have been so intense if I had uh, had eaten anything. So it definitely, it gave a completely different air to it. Um, I think there definitely is some benefit to doing longer fasts every once in a while, not all the yeah. time. Yep. But personally, I'm, I'm, I think the, like, the diet I found that I feel the best at is kind of what you were saying where, you know, I won't... Uh, I won't eat until later in the day. So it's a kind of uh, intermittent fasting. Yep. And I've also really liked, uh, it's called sometimes the uh, warrior diet or the one meal a day diet okay. where you basically have like a four hour or so feeding window. So it might be from like, you know, four to eight. 
<laughs> and uh, the whole day you don't eat anything, but from four to eight, you can eat anything. Like you can eat like a rotisserie chicken. If you like, you can eat a whole chicken. Um, and I really like that. I feel like that's like somehow more in tune with our body. Cause uh, I feel like our ancestors, they, you know, they, they might not they have, have eaten for days yeah. and then they might, might've had a big meal. Like they're, you know, pounds and pounds of meat and their body had to store it, use it well and not waste it. I think yeah. uh, what's what I found interesting about that kind of a dietary approach is that I would eat like insane amounts of food, mostly clean, like a lot of vegetables, meats, healthy proteins and stuff. But I wouldn't feel like uh, slowed down by it or like oh. like I would normally like if I ate, you know, half a rotisserie chicken, like. <sighs> as one of my four meals, I would like have to, you know, go lay down afterwards. But yeah. when I was only eating one meal a day, it's like my uh, digestive system. And there is like a lot of research about this. It got a chance to recover. So now it was like ready, good to go. And it had all its, you know, forces to, to deal with this extreme gluttony that would happen for four hours. <laughs> How uh, long did you try that diet for? Oh, that was Were for you- a few months. Oh, months. It was very easy, actually. It was very easy um, because when you when you do it for a few days, you lose all hunger. Like you'll your body gets like recalibrated to only be hungry during the feeding window. And then I think the key thing for uh, holding to it for me was really just allowing myself to eat anything. Like mm-hmm. not necessarily, you know, like complete utter crap. Like I wasn't yeah. eating like cake during my feeding window <laughs> or something like that. Although. Um, but I was just letting myself eat anything with no restriction. Like God. if I wanted to, you know, eat three bowls of cereal, like I'd eat three bowls of cereal. Like mm-hmm. I wouldn't like restrict myself and I was yeah. still losing weight, like insane with, with that. Um, is there anything else that you do specifically when you're trying to uh, cut down? Like, do you do any of these uh, kind of weight loss strategies through lo- losing water weight type of uh, type of things? Um, before one championship, when I had to lose, uh, when I had to cut water, I would drink distilled water and I would Mm. basically water load so that I'm constantly peeing. And then the day of the fight, I would just completely cut out the water and jump in the sauna, which is the worst. (laughs) But how did you feel? How did you feel for that? I hated it. I felt dead. I felt drained. Even dieting. Um, like from the 148 to 145, even though it's like three pounds, I was, I hated training. Like I, I don't like the process at all. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any insights on how that weight cutting problem could be solved? I know it's like a kind of big unresolved question of how do you, you know, keep people from dropping 10 pounds of water weight the night before Whoa. and putting some, themselves in danger actually when they fight. Well, actually they should all do what champ one championship does. So one championship their bantam weight category is 135 to 145. Mm. So as long as you're between 135 to 145, you are, you're good with all these other organizations. You have to be 135 on the dot to be 135. So when I used to have to cut to 135, I would diet from 152 to 143, 142, and then go in the sauna to lose that last seven pounds. Now I literally just need to die to 145 and not cut any water at all. Mm. So you probably so feel so much better. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's so. As far as um, injuries and things of that nature, what do you do? Is there any special uh, practices that you engage in to help yourself recover? Is there any kind of practitioners you see, like chiropractors, physical therapists, anything uh, to keep yourself in, in good shape? So I've had a reoccurring back injury from either squatting or deadlifting too much or too heavy. And like now I stay away from heavy weights, but I I hurt my lower back and it's, it'll come back if I ever squat too heavy or I, I'll just like tweak it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was traveling in Asia for four months. And during that four months, my lower back would hurt all the time. um, Primarily because I wouldn't let it rest. Mm. But anyways, sorry, backtrack before traveling to Asia, um, I had a lower back injury and I tried a chiropractor. I tried an acupuncture. Mm. I tried, um, what else I tried? I tried like everything you could think of and none of it worked. 
And the thing that worked was just literally letting it heal and not training. Mm -hmm. So mm. that's one of the hardest things to do is just resting. And that's the same with any injuries. I, I get injured quite often, to be honest. And mm -hmm. I always, as soon as I feel a bit better, I, I go back to train and then I, I injure it even more. But now I've learned to just take the required days to, to heal and it should go on, go away on its own. Um, but to answer your question, I actually do have a chiropractor that I see on a regular basis now. Um, he's a wizard is all I can say. He's Does he do uh, any specific uh, manipulations that you found uh, useful for you? Um, it, it all started from the back, my lower back. Mm -hmm. So I know I was saying that I, I saw a chiropractor and acupuncture and all of them. None of them actually helped and it, my back healed on its own, but then it was because it's a reoccurring injury. I heard it again. And, mm -hmm. um, this time I decided to try a chiropractor one more time and he literally like it's magic. He literally cracked my back and I was able, like it didn't, but the pain just went away. And then that's when I really started to believe in the, the skill of chiropractor. Yeah. It's uh, you know, I have some friends who are chiropractors and it's, they go through a pretty rigorous education. It's kind of like naturopathic where we learn pretty much the conventional things plus something else. Like we learn what uh, MDs learn in terms of like anatomy, physiology, uh, pathology, uh, diagnosis, all that kind of thing. But then we learn our specific thing. Like for naturopathic, it's like herbs and supplements and vitamins. And mm -hmm. for chiropractors, it's all of the different, you know, manipulations, which take a lot of skill. We learn a little yeah. bit of them in naturopathic yeah. school, but not anywhere near the depth that chiropractors learn it because that's like their focus. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary, but because he's always like cracking my neck and stuff, but it, it works. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Is there any, um, any kind of uh, supplements you take, any herbs you take, vitamins, anything like that you do to, uh, to stay at top shape? I take fish oils. Um, I've actually, I would say maybe four months ago, started trying supplements. I took creatine, uh, protein, collagen, and BCA. So I kind of tried it all at once. And for the first week or two, I felt uh, a boost in energy. I felt, uh, I felt like it worked, but mm -hmm. I'm kind of realizing that I'm, I'm not a supplements person mm -hmm. and I'm kind of getting lazy to take the supplements and mm -hmm. I kind of slowly just stopped taking it. Uh, yeah. So I, I would say in general, I don't take supplements. Right. There's a, there's a truth to that. Like, you know, just eating well and exercising, Yes, that fixes so many things that, uh, you know, like there's no quick fix for a lot of these mm -hmm. uh, kind of issues. Like even with your injuries, you're talking about sometimes just resting and doing nothing is the best approach, which seems counterintuitive because yes. our first move is to do something, go somewhere, you know, get uh, something to help us with there. I, I just don't like the idea of having to depend on, on supplements. Mm. And yeah, like you said, eating a well-balanced meal every day is the, the way to do it. As far as your uh, warmups for training, is there any uh, stretches you do, any specific routines you have for getting yourself limber? Um, very old school style. I, I like to skip to warm up. Um, I used to never s stretch at all, and mm -hmm. I'm actually not very flexible for being a martial artist, but I've made a, a goal to stretch every day, and I've been stretching every day for probably like five, six months now, and I'm finally getting flexible. Um, but yeah, I think stretching is so important, especially if you want to kick someone in the face. Yeah, exactly. That's the, that's the main thing. I'm still, you know, working on my head kicks and the main thing that's getting in the way isn't, you know, power or form. It's just literally my hip flexibility, flexibility is just not yeah. there. I have to, yeah. you know, lean over so much and it's kind of unnatural. And all it is, is just being consistent. Like a lot of people, like one of the most common questions asked is, uh, how do you, how do you kick someone in the head? Like, how do you stretch? Like you don't need to be an expert to learn how to stretch. Like you can Google it and you can find all the stretches in the world, but mm -hmm. you just got to do it consistently every day mm -hmm. and you will get results. But the second you, you are not consistent, then the stretching just, 
goes away. How long do you stretch for? Um, I'll stretch for, I find my, my little trick is I'll get into the position. So like when I'm cold or not warmed up and I, I stretch, like I can't go far at all. So I'll go down to, like I'll go down until I feel pain and then I'll hold for about a minute and then I'll stand back up and I'll kind of shake it off, move around. And then the second one, I'll, I'll immediately be able to go further, hold for another minute or so, get back up move around and then the third one is a lot further whereas i used to just go into the one position mm-hmm. like for example the splits i'll just go into that one position and just hold it for the straight like two three minutes but Ouch. i've less less um results and progress than if i were to do three sets mm. yeah stretching is uh it's so important especially for martial arts i mean the kickboxing particularly just because uh even if you can, you know, raise your leg high enough to kick them, you're wasting so much energy if you're not flexible because your yeah. own body is like resisting you doing it. So that means that you're just kind of overpowering your tendons. Yeah. And, and also um, it helps with uh, just being controlled. Like I was saying, I, I, I'm really focusing on technical sparring and uh, making sure that I'm not injuring my partner or vice versa. Mm. Is there any uh, recovery techniques that you do, like uh, like saunas, uh, cold plunges, anything that is part of your routine that you like to do, maybe after training or anything like that? On a regular basis, I uh, I just eat and sleep. <laughs> but in my last five weeks, like I literally just came back from Dubai, um, we had access to like a snow room and sauna. And I actually hurt my lower back during, during my training in Dubai as mm. well. And, uh, I literally went to the sauna, t- sauna room to the snow room back and forth for like a full day. When I say full day, I'm talking about like, we went to the sauna for the spa at like 9am to like 2pm. And, uh, I immediately felt better mm. when normally it would take much longer for my lower back to, to heal. Yeah. There's. There's a lot of research coming out uh, specifically about uh, saunas for recovery and uh, cryotherapy, it's called, which is like cold therapy. Yeah, I've tried that. Yeah. You have? Uh, yeah. Have you noticed anything helpful with that? Uh, for me personally, no, because apparently you need to try it like five times and you need to be consistent for you to see the results. I've only tried it like, you know, I've tried it at Evolve MMA once and then I've tried it once in Toronto sometime, but they're all separate occasions. So I didn't really get the effects, but I, I certainly believe in the effects. Mm. So I want to segue here to a kind of different uh, topic. So we live now in a world where it's seeming that everybody kind of has to make their own way. Like the way of the entrepreneur seems to be what's going to become more of the standard rather than the exception. <laughs> what, uh, what advice do you have for people who are trying to turn their passion into their work like you did with uh, martial arts and you know, creating a YouTube channel? Uh, do you have any advice for people? Uh, well, first find something that you actually love doing. Mm. Um, like that's a given, but find something that you actually love doing and find something that you're decently good at. For me, I love training martial arts. I think I'm decently good, but I don't think I'm the best, but because I think I'm decently good and I can see my, my growth in the sport, then I continually try to improve myself and be the best version of myself. Um, I would say consistency is one of the biggest things and uh, yeah, love what you do because I feel like there's thousands, if not millions of fighters out there that are better than me, more skilled than me, but they may not be able to do what I do because they don't have the passion for teaching and coaching. I Mm. love what I do. Um, I see my channel as my own little journal, my own little vlog. And um, I literally don't look at the numbers. I make my videos and again, I I see it as a a journey that I can look back years down the road and uh, I don't care about the numbers. I just enjoy doing it. That's beautiful. What originally inspired you to, uh, to start this journey of uh, teaching and sharing, uh, sharing your path on YouTube? So I've always uh, enjoyed helping others. That's why I wanted to get into law enforcement and become a police officer. And I've, 
learned that I loved teaching since I was 18, 19 years old when, uh, back when my uh, instructor got me to teach. Mm-hmm. So I started teaching when I was like 18, 19, teaching martial arts. And what really turned it into reality is when I went to Thailand and met uh, Sean Fagan, mm. the Muay Thai guy, and saw that he was helping millions of people around the world through his online social media. And, uh, you know, he told me that I could do the same. And, you know, it, it was four years ago, and now I'm helping who knows how many people. But I literally get uh, messages daily saying like, hey, your video helped me win my fight or your video helped me lose three kilograms. And hearing that's really motivating and inspires me to continue doing what I do. Mm. That's the uh, that's the beauty of it. That motivation aspect you bring up. It's hard to start, right? I mean, you're just like against almost like a brick wall. Like, how do I start a YouTube channel? How do I start a company? But once you get past that inertia, it is self-motivating. Like, especially yeah. when people start saying like, oh, I really like what you do or, oh, that helped me a lot. Then you get a kind of more genuine drive. Whereas maybe in the beginning, you're like, I don't know why I'm doing this. Maybe it's a cool yeah. idea. But later you're like, I need to do this. And then that whole issue of like consistency becomes uh, like a non-issue because you you want to do it. So yes. sometimes you have to even stop yourself from working too much. I think yeah, that's the key of like, you know, you found your passion when that's, that's how it yeah. is. It's definitely a slow start. It's a very slow start. And I have motivated many of my friends and just people I know to start their own channel and they all started. And then like, I told them like, it's going to be a slow start, but you know, two months down the road, they all just stopped. Mm -hmm. So yeah. They didn't have that, uh, that are like that, uh, that drive to get past the, I guess the initial hump, especially now, like if you're starting a YouTube yeah. channel, like expect to get like 50 views, like yeah, it, expect, takes a long expect time. To, it takes a long time. How long was it before you, you kind of, um, looked at your channel and you're like, wow, this is actually getting pretty big now. How long was it before that point for you? I think a year and a half. But again, I didn't have much expectation. So mm. like it was like when I had 5,000 subscribers, I was like, wow, 5,000 people, you know? So I, I didn't have a high expectation to begin with. So maybe that kind of helped. But also the fact that I kind of vlogged my journey. So whether people watch or not, it didn't matter to me. Mm. I think that's a, that's a really good approach to it because that kind of protects you against the kind of pitfalls that are inevitable, which is, you know, not getting the kind of reception you wanted. Like if you have any expectations, if it doesn't meet them, you're just so much more likely to quit. That's why it's so, I think it's important to do it for yourself. When you make videos, what's, what's the idea behind them? Are you trying to make something specific for people or are you more just kind of documenting what you're interested in, what you're doing? It started off, um, my passion for helping others and teaching others. So I would teach a, for example, I would teach a class and the way I structured it, I'd get feedback from my students and be like, they'd be like, uh, I really like the way you structured a class. Um, you know, please keep doing, keep doing you, you know? So then I thought like, Hey, I could kind of structure this into a a YouTube video. And so that's how it started. I would kind of brainstorm and be like, Hmm, I'll teach uh, five counters to the jab, for example, and, and make videos that way. But now that I've been doing it for a while, I don't think of it that way. I literally just, uh, I wash my sparring and I break down the techniques that I do there's that I pull off because I don't really believe in teaching things that I cannot pull off. Mm. And that's why I have my sparring to back it up. So I'll watch my sparring footage and say, I counter the low kick in five different ways. Then I I'm like, Oh, okay. I do that. And then um, I collect the footage. And then once I have all the sparring footage, then I make the video. Um, I also find that because I'm a, naturally athletic guy there's a lot of movements and things that i do that i that i never learned 
So I'll watch my footage and I'll be like, oh, I do that. And I'll, I'll think like, who taught me that? Nobody taught me that. Mm. It just came out naturally. And then I'll just break down what I did and teach it to others. Oh, that's awesome. So it's like uh, you're basically just learning and you're kind of picking through your material and trying to almost like curate it into some kind of uh, lesson rather than saying, you know, today I'm going to make a video for five best head kick tips. Exactly. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll try to do both. I'll try to do both. But I find recently that's what I've been. Yeah, that's the way I do it. Mm. Do you do any uh, any special things in terms of like promotion or marketing or like uh, search engine optimization or anything like that? Or do you just try to make really good videos and you just you send them off? So for the first year and a half to two years, it was just uh, I just made videos the way I wanted. Um, the lighting was terrible. The <laughs> fonts was hilarious. Uh, and then I met my fiance and my fiance is more business. You know, she knows she, she has like a double major in like business or whatever. And she kind of helped me with the aesthetics and uh, she helps me with the business side, but I'm just, I'm the martial artist. I'm the coach, the teacher, and she kind of helps me with the rest of it. Mm. Who have been your uh, biggest like personal inspirations for your journey? Um, like coaches say, you had, mentors, uh, friends. I would say Sean Fagan would be the biggest inspiration because I saw that he could make a living off what he loved doing. And he literally showed me the way. And so I would give him credit for that. Mm. So what, uh, what does your life look like moving forward? Like, what are your dreams, your goals? What are, what are you looking to do? Are you looking to continue uh, fighting professionally? Are you looking to travel the world and teach? What, what's, what's in your mind right now? My goal dream is to continue traveling around the world, teaching and training. Um, I've started a few train and travel vlogs where like I've traveled to Korea, Japan, Singapore. I've traveled to quite a bit of Asian countries and mm. uh, vlogged my training. I want to continue doing that, but unfortunately, COVID halt put a halt yeah. to that. Um, but as soon as uh, as soon as that ends, as soon as it becomes normal to travel again, I'm definitely going to do that. Uh, I actually want to start traveling to different countries and learning different martial arts as well. And uh, I can't wait to host another train and travel camp. So I don't know if you are aware of that. Yeah, I know you were uh, you were doing some uh, camps where people can come to a location and you were teaching. Yeah, yeah I remember it's, a, it's that. just it's just a great time because, you know, when I first held like when I held my first camp, I was kind of nervous that I would get like idiots coming and you know people that want to challenge me and like mm -hmm. who knows you know like I was <laughs> I didn't know what to expect. Right. But it turns out that both camps, everybody that came, they were just passionate martial artists looking to learn super genuine good people and we would uh, you know we actually still have uh, like group chats and we still talk to each other it's been like a year now and we still talk to each other on a regular basis and uh you know you meet up with these passionate martial artists you train together and then you go hang out it's just a it's a great time so uh and they also really want to learn from me so it's a very rewarding feeling to be friends with them. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And I bet, you know, when you were first starting out making videos, you had like no idea what would happen. You were kind of just, you know, yeah. just doing your daily. That's, exactly. that's awesome. So how can people, uh, how can people find out about the next one or sign up for the next in-person retreat? Um, I have the link, but I don't know here. Hold on. Let me just check real quick. We can, uh, I'll link it in the, uh, in the video for sure. Okay. Well, it, all it is actually is www.mashrader.com slash train travel camp. If you uh, sign up there, we will get the uh, email notification whenever a camp is organized. Or if you follow me on uh, Instagram or YouTube, you'll probably get the notification as well, because when the time comes, I'll most likely be promoting it through those mm -hmm. uh, platforms. And on uh, Instagram, your name is MMA shredded, right? That's correct. 
And uh, YouTube, it's Jeff Chan, MMA Shredded. Yes. Why uh, Why the change? I remember it was just MMA Shredded. Like, um, is it so be, people can find you easier or? Um, to be quite honest, um, my fiance wanted me to put the name up there, but also because uh, I guess we're in discussion whether we should change the name uh, just because... MMA Shredded was supposed to be a fitness-focused channel, but mm-hmm. it turns out that I'm, I am, I'm focused on fitness, but I'm more focused on technique and breakdowns. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It gives you, if it's more under like your journey, it gives you more freedom rather than yeah. being like, you know, this is where this is all videos to get you shredded. Like, yeah, where that, that limits you. Branch off. Yeah. Uh, I asked because I, I did the same thing recently with this podcast. It was originally just called the Herbal Hour podcast. Okay. Now it's called Dr. Dan's Herbal Hour. And it was for the exact same reason yeah. where I'm trying to, because um, I originally started it. I was like, you know, I'm going to have like hour talks with herbalists and like, that's all I'm going to do. <laughs> and then I started finding a whole bunch of guests in different fields, like, yeah. you know, chiropractors and homeopaths and yoga instructors martial artists, musicians. And I was like, I actually want to talk about their views on health. I don't just want to limit myself to that. So um, I can totally relate to kind of trying to shift uh, yeah. a brand like that. Exactly. So people can, you know, actually find you and stuff. That would be, yeah. that'd be good. Um, it's cause, cause honestly I've met a lot of people who they're like, um, aren't you the MMA shredded guy? Yeah. By the way, what's, by the way, what's your name? Yeah. What's your name? <laughs> Yeah, I like, uh, believe me. I've had like a lot of people <laughs> yeah. do that to me. So, uh, any any plans for a fight coming up, or is everything pretty much on uh, on hold now because of COVID? Um, actually, while I was in Dubai, I got offered a bout uh, for December, but I turned it down because the timing just didn't align. Mm-hmm. Um, I left Dubai December first, and the fight would have been December seventeenth. So that so I'd basically have to leave again in like a week. And I just finished quarantining. So as I was mentioning earlier, like I'm I'm in I'm I'm in decent shape, but I'm not in fight shape by mm-hmm. any means. So coming back to Canada, I would have to quarantine and then that would be a halt to my training for a bit. If I stayed in Dubai, then it would be very costly. Um, I'd have to find, you know, places to stay or if i travel to thailand to finish my camp then i'd have to quarantine and and do the same so it just didn't line up and uh i thought i'm happy doing my thing right now um as i mentioned again earlier i don't see myself as fighter i see myself as a martial artist Mm. fighting is a bonus to me um if i get offered a fight and the timing is right then i'll take it if not i'm happy continuing doing what i'm doing I'm a hundred percent there with you. Uh, and I had a kind of similar view to, uh, doing actual competitions, um, where I I don't want to be a pro fighter, but I want to have like real experiences so that, you know, when I, uh, master certain techniques and stuff, maybe like 10 or 20 years down the road. And I can teach people and I can say, listen, like, this is like how you actually apply it in a real life fight on the street, God forbid, or, you know, in the ring, um, which is, it's just such a different thing. Like, I think, I think anybody who, uh, you know, trains martial arts and does like contact martial arts or spars or anything, it is, really good to at least get one amateur fight in just to see what it's like. Cause exactly. I think it revolutionizes your, um, your whole view towards training because you suddenly see like all the pieces fit together. Like you understand why you were drilling that for like hours. You understand why it was so uncomfortable and sparring. Cause then when you get in the real thing, the first thing you want to do is just like get better. Cause you're like, wow, exactly. I, I wasn't even able to apply like, you know, 20% of what I, of what I know in there. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally what agree. was your experience of your first fight? Um, first amateur fight. I um, I won by unanimous decision, and um, apparently, because I forgot, but apparently, I threw the same combination over forty times, <laughs> which was <laughs> bread the, and butter. Which is the hook to hook to low kick. Like I just kept throwing it over nice. and over again. <laughs> 
Um, and that's, that's what I drill, right? Like you don't need to do too many fancy techniques. You do simple, basic, effective combinations with the, an advanced technique here and there. Right. So there's this idea that, you know, what you practice most, that's what will come out because when you're exactly. in sparring or especially in a competition level, it's like your mind is blank and you're, you can't learn something. You're not going to do some like new technique. Like exactly. you're going to do what you can't help but doing like, and that could be a good habit or a bad habit too. Yeah. I actually have a funny story for you. So like, I think it was two fights ago, but mm -hmm. I was drilling the inside low kick to the jab cross combination. Mm -hmm. And I kept drilling that over and over again during my training camp. It was a combo that I really liked. And um, yeah, so I had the fight and I had planned to throw the inside low kick, the jab cross. And then after the fight, I went to my coach and I'm like, damn it. I, I didn't throw the combination. Like, I, I wonder why. And my coach kind of was like, okay. He's just like, okay, sure. And then later on, I went to go look at my, like when I rewatched the tape, I realized I threw it three times, but mm. I just, you just didn't remember. I just didn't remember, but I actually threw it three times. Mm. When you're, uh, so you were saying before, when you're kind of in the ring, you're uh, you're calm. In your most recent fights, like, what are you, um, what are you thinking about? Like, I remember my coach told me like one specific thing is like the first round you go in and you try all your moves and you see kind of what lands and what sticks or you try to faint and you try to get reads for like later what kind of things like that are you doing from the kind of like mental aspect is there anything you're actually thinking about when you're uh, facing off i like to i like to feel my opponent out move mm -hmm. around and, and and yes faint is a big thing to see how their hands react and you know say i faint and i see that you see him parry then that means i'm going to go for the left hook um low kicks is a big thing so i like to kind of throw a tester low kick to see if they check or not and then whether his style is lifting his leg to check or stepping out to dodge that completely changes what i'm going to do next got it so you're kind of like uh trying moves seeing how they react and then kind of adapting to it yes yeah that's that's awesome well jeff chan thank you uh thank you so much for uh for sharing your path with us um I encourage anybody who's interested in martial arts or wants to get started, check out his uh, his channel, MMA Shredded. It's really good. Uh, you should be charging people money for it probably because there's just so much good good content and very applicable things. Uh, I follow uh, a few different martial arts channels like you know like Fight Tips and uh, and and things of that nature, but I found your your channel was the most directly useful for like sparring where i could so i'll i'll do work like kind of with um with my gym mates like outside of the gym like where we train certain things and i found that it was able to give me uh like a specific list of things to work on like i was watching one of your videos where it was like the parry to the kick i think it was one yeah, of the yeah, more, yeah. more recent ones mm -hmm. and i started doing it and i'm like this is like really good like why didn't anybody <laughs> teach me this it's so like it's so high percentage and it's mm -hmm. You know, it's like sometimes with traditional martial arts things, they have these really like fancy techniques that like you'll never be able to pull off in sparring. But some of them are just like really straightforward and they almost always work if you do them right. So there's exactly. a lot of that kind of stuff on your channel. So I'll definitely be uh, definitely be watching along and, and uh, appreciating your journey, man. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. And thank you for supporting and watching my content. It means a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll have uh, we'll have links to all your uh, all your stuff below on the uh, YouTube channel. And uh, hopefully people will check out your uh, in person trainings. Maybe I'll uh, I'll come through one time if I if I can. I would I'd love, love to, to have I'd love you. to train with you, man. Perfect. Well, I mean, we'll stay in touch. All right. Jeff Chan and me shredded.